don't be over smart. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond. Okay. Lai 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 lai. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, no guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> very hard. Right. Very hard. I also think it's very hard. I just learned. So hi, I'm Renu, and I'm a mobile developer at Grab. Uh, maybe I have done few conferences. That's why maybe I'm eligible to sit here. I have participated in few conferences like uh, extended Google I/O and Mobius Russia conference. Many meetups, WW Code meetups, and a uh, few other local uh, conferences. Um, that's all. I don't know what else to say about me. Maybe somebody should have interviewed me and say good things about me, right? <laughs> uh, hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I uh, I was from SP Digital. I was QA. So now I'm moving towards product management. Uh, for me, I'm. Up to now, I'm not 100% sure why I was chosen, but, but no, 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 no. But the thing is that because I'm a junior dev, so uh, in terms of like less than two years ago, I did not know what HTML and CSS was. But uh, but anyway, I've delivered a tech talk in junior dev, and I delivered the same talk internally at SP Digital as well. So um, and actually, before I switched to tech, I was. Um, involved in the exco of my company's Toastmasters Club. If you don't know what Toastmasters is, it's a peer, it's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring uh, for public speaking. So I guess may, yeah, maybe that's why I'm here. So yeah, I hope you guys will enjoy the panel. Hi, uh, my name is Elisha. Actually, before that, actually, you, when I was younger, I thought like Toastmaster. Do they just talk about talking while eating toast? Like why is there like, toast is as in a yam thing toast or like the like mian bao toast? <laughs> like, anyway, um, I'm the developer programs manager for Facebook and for business in Singapore, obviously. And outside of my daytime job, I am the founder of Tech Ladies, which is a community for women to learn how to code. So in, in terms of my speaking experience, I feel like I want to inspire confidence, but actually I also like like them. So not quite sure why I'm here, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so my background is I graduated with a psychology degree and I really start talking about technical stuff when I was trying to like inspire and look for a tech co-founder. I never did find a tech co-founder, but through the experience, I begin to talk a lot um, everywhere. So I guess that's why I'm here. So happy to be here and sharing more about how to talk over toast. <laughs> hey, hi, uh, my name is King Ming. Uh, so as I intro myself, in the talk just now, I work in SP Digital. So I do IoT stuff, uh, in case you don't know, it stands for Internet of Things. It's a mixture of both uh, hardware and software. Okay, so uh, outside of work, I, I'm organizer for hackware. So it's a hardware meetup. Right? Then uh, I also just recently got my private pilot's license. Yes, <laughs> so yes, I can fly a plane. Yeah, <laughs> so now I'm back to work. Uh, as for conference speaking experience, uh, I've spoken at uh, three conferences, uh, iOS, Conf, uh, GopherCon. Yeah, then for meetups, I have like 20 something recordings of me on engineers.ig. So, yeah, quite a lot already. So, maybe this will be my 30th one, I think. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so clearly uh, my panelists all don't know why they are here. Uh, that <laughs> reflects really well on me. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks. But, okay, seriously, like everyone is here, as you can see, very different. And so, I think the point here is to show that there is no one set profile that you have to fit if you want to get into uh, speaking and all that like any background uh, like and however you are whoever you are also can one everybody also can one yeah uh, so okay my first point is introduce themselves say nice things or I will say nice thing about you okay none next so the focus here a uh, uh, first half of this workshop was more about like uh, CFP writing and, and, and stuff so this this section is like your CFP has been accepted. Ah, and then now you have to do the work to actually write the talk. So that's quite a big portion. Even though the CFP was, was work, this is, was, you, after you get accepted, there is more work. Ah, but don't let that deter you. So now let's talk about talk preparation. Um, first question. Okay, uh, How do you make your talk interesting? Uh, okay, so for... If, if you notice, uh, two of our panelists are, are more on the technical side. 
well, uh, the two ladies sitting in the center have uh, are here to pro give us more public speaking, how to be a good public speaker presenter tips. So everyone very relevant. So I would like to hear from everyone like your own take on what feel what you feel makes your talk interesting. Okay, my turn to shine before they talk about the technical stuff. Then I'm like, uh, why am I here? Okay, so how to make your talk interesting? I think a lot of uh, designing a talk happens before the talk, before the conference, right? Because when you start thinking about, even before you start crafting about your story, you need to know who are the audience. What is the profile? Who are they? What would they find interesting? The thing about public speaking is that it's not just about what you want to say, but it's about what you want to say that's going to be useful for the audience. So be very audience-minded. I'm sure like everyone has listened to talks or like you know have been in a school where the teacher just drone on and on and on and really really boring. That's because I think there's a clear disconnect between the audience and the speaker. So understanding your audience is very important. The next thing about crafting your presentation is to tell a story. So. So when it comes to storytelling, everything can be a everything can be a story. I think that gentleman over there was like, you know, uh, he was trying to do like a PS4 emulator. So he went on a he started with a story, right? Like I was kind of bored and want to do this. Decided to I found a GitHub Git gist or something, and I understand nothing. <laughs> but here I'm gonna try something, and I'm gonna try something bigger. That itself is talk. I don't know if you realize it. That is a story. One of the favorite sort of story up that I like to use is the hero goes on a journey. So like, for example, how many of you watch like Lord of the Rings? Okay, so you know, right? Like these little two happy hobbits like hobbiting around and, and then there is a mission, right? You have to return this ring to like this mountain and then burn it, right? And then they start on a journey, then you know, they have a few you, uh, troubles and then at the end of the day, there's a fight, the big boss and then you end the story. So a lot of times, I actually take inspiration from Disney uh, in how they craft their story. Because everything can be a story, and storytelling is what invests, what, what draws the audience into, into your presentation. Because like, even, even people don't understand that. Like, I don't understand what's a PS4 emulator, but I was drawn into the story to like, figure out, okay, what did you do in the end? Like, how did you get over the, the challenge? And I see it in my own life as well. Like, people have zero interest in entrepreneurship or community. They want to find out how my story went on. That's, that's how like, I draw them into, into my story. So keeping it interesting is definitely like, uh, how, this, like having your audience in mind and tell them a story. That's how you can make your talk interesting. The rest is, of course, like tell jokes if you can, but don't tell jokes if you cannot. If you tell a joke, it, it like, didn't land, move on. Like, don't, don't like cry there or something. I don't know how to save you. Um, so that's on the storytelling preparation side. On the very um, logistical side, one of the tips that I, can, I would like to share is to also understand the environment. Um, for example, what are some of the equipment that you will be provided on stage? Like, how big is the stage? Are you going to be seated? Are you going to be standing? Is there going to be a podium or are you expected to walk around? Because I guess like for beginners, I would say it's okay for you to hide behind the podium so you feel safe and you can read your speaker notes right in front of you. But as you get more experiences, challenge yourself to start walking around the stage. The mic that you have will also make a difference in terms of your performance, like your presentation. If you're going to be like clicked on like that, you have both of your hands free and you can do like a gesture and like whatnot. And you probably, you probably want to check if you have that if you're going to do coding. But if you're going to have a handheld and you'll probably be holding a clicker, your gestures is quite lame. Huh? So you've got to be watch out for it. I can tell you one story. I didn't realize, but I was, I was doing this. Holy fuck, in a, in a photo. <laughs> and like, I really want to like, I wouldn't want to die because it's, it's a Facebook event, right? And then I realized I was doing this because I was just like, pointing at people. Nah. I wasn't really careful about my gesture. Good thing I was holding on the clicker so it could look kind of like, like that. But otherwise, like, oh shit, might be fired. Don't fire me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so understanding your, understand your environment. And these are things that, that you should uh, talk to the organizer about to find out what are some of the equipment there and also who are the audience will be, will be there. Okay, my 10 minutes is up. <laughs> Actually, I think a lot of the points that Elisha mentioned are also points that I also want to highlight. But yeah, so 
Um, so like what Elisha mentioned, um, people like to hear a story. Nobody likes to hear a lecture. And, and also it's like everybody likes to root for the hero most of the time. So if you're able to craft a story around your topic and lead, and lead people on the journey with you through the topic to explore the topic, then that is very useful because, um, uh, because it makes it engaging and it's like people can also try to put themselves uh, in the shoes of like someone who is exploring this topic, so one so a good um, a good resource to draw for like what to choose is something you experienced it yourself, and also try to craft it in a way like how would you talk about this topic to your past self who did not know anything about this topic beforehand? So it is a good gauge because because um, your previous self knew nothing about it, and most likely a lot of the audience doesn't know what you went through exactly. So it's good to start from like a base of like zero and try to explain them so that they, um, their level of understanding is based from absolutely nothing to at least somewhat closer to what your current understanding is now. And it's also, it's easier for the audience to digest as well. And um, yeah, and people can understand and you know, say, oh, this is why uh, you've done this and I can see why you've gained so much and I've gained a lot as well in the process. Which is good. Um, as for uh, preparation, what I like to do is I like to watch a lot of TED talks or TEDx talks because these are speakers who are people who are like uh, subject matter experts, but they're able to to uh, to sort of talk about the topic in a way that is engaging and interesting for people coming from all sorts of backgrounds and even people who are not there who may not know anything, but yet yeah, they're able to like keep you engaged and. So you just observe how they talk, ex uh, observe how they use the slides or whatever material uh, to present. And one thing about um, like for slides, right? Try to make sure that if if you're allowed to use slides, um, try to make sure that you use font that is clear and can be seen from right at the back. Um, try to avoid using Comic Sans because it's ugly. <laughs> Um, but also, like I think, try to avoid using animations where possible. So if you have pictures, try to use a still picture. Try not to use a GIF, or try not to use videos uh, unless absolutely necessary. Because uh, number one is like there's extra technical aspects to factor in, and number two, maybe um, it may not be compatible with the projector or something, or like the sound may not work. So it's extra things to factor in, and generally. Um, yeah, I think people want to hear you speak. They may not want to to watch a, to go to a conference just to watch a video they can see online. Um, yeah. So, but also when it comes to practice, try to practice in front of the mirror, and try to practice to the point where you don't need to use notes if you can. Because I have I've watched talks where people have the notes and during the talk they fumble the notes, and if they're not careful, the sound can be picked up by the mic and it's very very distracting. So try to avoid using notes where possible. And it's also a lot more natural for it's a lot more natural for you to speak to someone in a conversation than for you to read from a script to someone else. It sounds more natural without notes. So if you can move towards the direction, but of course this takes a lot of practice. So practice as much as you can. But if not, try to keep your notes to a minimum. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the, the two of them have provided a very broad base like you even if you're not doing a technical talk you can do it so now specifically i want to target like the two who are because when i mentioned making talks interesting those are really good points but it's harder to when you say you don't think about storytelling and a technical topic so is it do do yourselves do you all apply this storytelling technique to the technical talks that you are give your give for some technical talks, right, it may be difficult to have a story. Mm. It could be really like a lecture style. So uh, what I try to do is then why not I make my topic interesting rather than the format of how I give it. So one way I like to do is like I try to have merge two different fields. So for example, uh, I spoke in iOS conference. Then in, in reality, I don't do iOS in my work. I'm uh, actually a hardware person at work. So I thought, why not uh, in every other talk Every other talk in the iOS conference, of course, is about iOS stuff. Why not I try to mix it with something else? So uh, since I'm uh, in the hardware area, why not I just mix uh, iOS and uh, hardware topic? La? 
So the one topic I gave at iOS conference two years ago was Swift on IO, or Swift on uh, Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. So that in itself it it makes us two different fields together. So it's a refreshing topic compared to everything else is on Swift coding on a phone, right? Yeah. So you can actually try this tactic. I think uh, another speaker I know she she merged JavaScript and hardware also, mm -hmm. and she gave it a JS. I think it's like yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Im Im immediately, right, it's refreshing because almost every JavaScript thing is either uh, web, running on the web or running on the back end, Node.js on the back end, right? So when you have JavaScript and hardware, wow, well, win already. <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> thought already, right? <laughs> yeah, so the, that's one of my ways of doing it. Uh. Yeah. Yes, um, for me, actually, I do try this storytelling part quite a lot. And uh, actually, for me, the storytelling part is whenever, like, whichever country I go to, I try to le uh, learn few words of their language. Like, when I was going to Russia, a few of my colleagues are Russians. Like, so I know that, okay, I'm going to Moscow, so I started being friends with them, like, uh, quite before the uh, conference. And then I'm like, okay, how do you say hello? Okay, what's the common phrase in Russian? What's the, what are the um, funny slangs that you use in Russian? And I, try to start my talk with those words. Like it makes me feel connected with the audience and it makes it makes them feel like, okay, yeah, I mean, she knows a bit about this. So I do like to read history and few words of their language. I have done that quite a lot. Like even in India, in different states, like we have dialects, so uh, quite, I mean, and many, many dialects. And I, I usually forget those words after a while. So like if I go to Russia again, maybe I'll learn those words again. So uh, that technique has been really helpful and it has been really funny uh, because actually, first of all, our accent uh, telling those words, it's really funny. So people immediately start laughing on that, uh, on those words. Apart from that, I guess I use uh, uh, tweets uh, in my slides sometimes because actually as a developer, as an engineer, we tend to follow many famous developers or engineers, right? And uh, whenever they see some sentences from them on the slides in my talk, they feel it's relevant and the credibility gets increased. So I have done this that taking a snapshot of the Twitter and uh, tweets from famous person and then put it into my slides. So these two techniques I have been doing. Uh, and yeah, I do like to crack jokes, but uh, many times they are not funny. Actually, there had been an incident and that too in Moscow that I was trying, uh, trying to tell a shitty joke and then nobody laughed and I waited for a few seconds that maybe, maybe someone will laugh and nobody laughed and then I moved on. I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, these are the things that I try. Mm, yeah, that's all. Yeah, since uh, I think the questions, I've just thrown them out of the window because clearly uh, this is not a format that's going. So any hardly, any hardly, hashtag any hardly. So what we mentioned just now, like re really useful points, especially if, if you're, you're going uh, international conference right but a lot of everybody has touched upon the presentation and the word slides was mentioned so I'm gonna bring it back to uh, my my fa fairly more technical counterparts again right uh, slides if it's a technical talk there's code involved mm -hmm. so what's the approach to what's uh, code or demos or that sort of thing right um, any suggestions on how you would if something that you want to talk about involves code, how would you present it without like showing a screen, a, a sea of text on your, would you use slides? Or do you even just live code the thing? Any, any what, what, what's your thought process on, on that sort of a presentation? Um, I guess it really depends what exactly is the talk about for sure. And then if it, does involve live coding, I would recommend that you go for live coding. I know it involves extra practice, like extra caution, because things, Murphy's Law, like it's applicable, especially when you do the live coding, and anything can go wrong. But the impact of live coding, it's really huge. It's really huge. And you don't have to put extra effort to keep audience engaged when you're doing the live coding. I think the engagement, it's, it's spontaneous, it's immediate. Rather than having slides full of text and you trying to explain and then looking at people's expression and you're like, oh no, nobody's getting what I'm trying to say. So I think live coding, that gets immediate attention and uh, kind of, you can get that immediate live feedback as well. Like, okay, yeah, people are getting engaged. Like they're, they're trying to understand what's going on. I have given few docs in which I have included live coding. Uh, I did that on extended uh, Google I.O. and I have received that feedback that in your entire talk, the last 15 minutes were great in which I did the live coding. So I think for me, it, it really 
goes a long way if your talk presents live coding but that comes with its own hard practice um, quiet background music during live coding <laughs> because there's always these moments where like that just half a minute of, of something going on and then the music and that's the beat good, in the background keeps tip. the audience connected that's a it good really tip. helps I know King Ming does hardware have you hardware demoed on stage before? yes I, I did it before on a for example iOS conference right I did a live demo on tracking your position based on the beacons so I was really scared, you know, like imagine if I show a live demo and it show a wrong location, then it's like, wow. So uh, one way I, uh, to mitigate this, right, is you can take a video. You can use it as a really last resort, like if your live demo fails, right, at least you just use your video. Okay, see, this I've done it that way. Uh, as for other than hardware stuff, right, uh, for live coding, so one way I do is that you can, like, you just comment out the code before that, they just uncomment it when you're ready to use it. <laughs> then another way is uh, okay. One presentation I did at GolferCon was actually to type a lot of bash commands. So rather than typing out by hand, right, you can actually script it beforehand. I use a tool called Demo Magic. You can Google it. So basically, you just script out all your commands beforehand. They just press enter, enter, enter. Then it will just key the the bash commands for you. They just press enter, then execute. Because I have like twenty bash commands, and I don't want to type it out. I will make mistakes. <laughs> so you can just like pre do everything. Just enter, 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 enter. Yeah. So that's one way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so Renu also mentioned practice, like the, you, if you're going to do live code, it's extra practice. But in general, right, like everybody, right, before you go on stage, how much time do you take to do all your practice, rehearse, and like what do you actually do for the rehearse, rehearsal slash practice? Do you, I don't know, like you mentioned talk it out in front of a mirror or like what, what? What goes like what each of you I believe have a different uh, strategy. So it's it'd be nice to hear like everybody's strategy because it's gonna be very different for everybody, right? Yeah. Okay, for me it's like for, okay for me before I delivered my very first tech talk because I was actually really scared because I've never delivered something that's so technical. When at Toastmasters, when we deliver talks, usually something that is very general, a bit more general or something that's very personal to you. To to the speaker, or it's a very impromptu thing. So it's so tech talk for me was something very different. So I what I did was uh, the topic I did was how to learn something hard in tech, and I incorporated what I learned um, when I learned to use the Apache J meter at, for a work related task into um, into my talk. But I so not just the storytelling element, but also say this is how I applied it to a real life thing. So um, when it came to practice, I would sit down with like my tech lead for the project and just like run through, like um, this is why this is uh, how it would be as though you are presenting it. Uh, another thing also is to try to film yourself delivering the talk into the camera. So not only can you review what you have spoken, but you can also see how long it took for you to deliver the talk and see if it's within a time limit. And just keep on doing that until like you feel a lot more confident and you feel like you are within the time limit that's that uh, that the conference organizers have set for you. And uh, this one it, it really helps. Like, I use it for I used it for Toastmasters, also uh, just to review how I did. So not just your practice, but also on the day itself, if you can get a live if, if you can get a recording of your speech review it after you've done it. So that if you do like subsequent iterations of the same talk or if you're talking about something else, you know like how like how you did on the actual day itself and then you can improve for future talks as well. Yeah, I think like practice is definitely uh, something you should do. So like for me when I start thinking about like what I what I want what the presentation, what my story is gonna be like, I would actually say it out loud so that I can craft the script and the slides accordingly and and then I, I would recommend this app called Otter, O-T-T-E-R it basically is a voice to text transcript and it's free so it's super awesome I try to do that so it's easier to write my script so as I am writing my script I will also figure out like um, what are some points of the story that I want to change my voice either getting super excited or you know, start to slow down because I'm got talking about some emotional stuff. I will also start thinking about the hand gestures. 
uh, like what at some point when I want I want to use my hands to sort of further point out the differences, and also try to be like mindful about like don't do the Nazi salute. <laughs> 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 so in terms of like practicing, of course you you want to film yourself doing it, or you can ask a friend to just be there to point out like what are some of the things that you can improve on because a lot of things that you can think about, but there's sometimes the things that you do are not conscious. Like for nervous speakers, sometimes they sway a little bit. Uh, for first-time speakers, sometimes they go a bit crazy on their hand gestures. So, so that these are things that you won't think about until you're already there. And having someone to rehearse with will help you spot this kind of uh, mistakes or things that you do in the subconscious. Uh, another way is to rehearse in front of your colleagues. Uh, for example, in SP Digital, we actually have a weekly tech talk session. So uh, anyone of us, right, we can choose to okay, give a talk about anything we want. And many a time, speakers like myself and my colleagues, right, we use that like the rehearsal training ground. So actually, you get live feedback from your colleagues, uh, and then probably they are less judgmental of you. Uh, right? So it's much better. And Michael helpfully will record for us. So we use that as a good opportunity to watch ourselves and another uh, good thing is that you get to rehearse with the actual equipment right so for example uh, if you rehearse it by yourself at home right you don't usually have a microphone with you but now when you're giving it to your colleagues right you have the benefit of this uh, microphone the lapel mic then you can actually get a feel of what it's actually like to give a talk for real so now you can figure out the logistical problems rather than talking to a, just a mirror or just uh, your two or three friends, right? So, yeah, so I feel that's a very good way to try. And I'll just quickly add on to, again, like the rehearsing and also rehearsing with equipment. This is why it's important to find out from the organizer what equipment you have. So usually at home, if I know I'm going to have a clicker or a mic, I'll be holding something like maybe my phone and I'll hold an actual clicker that I have. Um, or if you know that you prefer to have a clicker but the venue don't have, I make sure you bring your own. So, so yeah, because I need to make sure that as I talk my finger, I just know when to like twitch a little bit so that I can go to the next slide. Um, so one thing that I usually like to tell myself is assume that everything that can go wrong, go, go wrong will go wrong. So always have like a backup of your presentation. Um, like if you are doing a live coding demo, make sure you have like a backup video, and like just make sure you have a backup of everything, and so that in case anything, any technical failure happens on the day itself, you don't have to panic and say, "Oh, what's the next option?" You already have the next option available. Uh, so, yeah. I think I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, I do. I do uh, kind of mix all these practices. I guess these are the best practices that anybody would uh, kind of uh, take into uh, practicality. Apart from that, I guess nowadays conferences have started providing this support for you to uh, help you uh, in guiding that how to be the best presenter that you can be. So they'll uh, kind of they'll schedule a few sessions with you so that you can rehearse with them. And uh, I think that's that's a very positive from conferences that is coming right into thing apart from that i guess yeah i mean even at grab like we have these uh, weekly thursdays we have other meetups and actually i use uh, <laughs> i use my presentation to uh, i mean i kind of give that presentation to my teammates as well they know whenever Reno is trying to present something that means she's trying to just use us as as an audience uh, for her next conference but it really helps because uh, this is something which is new for them as well and uh, and I get, I, I mean, I get honest feedback for that. I mean, they are the most critical person <laughs> I ever got. So yeah, try to ex uh, try to rehearse that with your teammates. Try to rehearse with your friends because they can be really honest with you. They don't have to fake it for you, right? And uh, that's that's all. I mean, whatever these guys have suggested, I guess uh, the mix of all these would work for you. Yeah. So you mentioned that. Uh, now we've, we've talked about talk prep, but like on the day, especially since you do uh, a fair bit of live coding, right? 
are there is there like a checklist that you 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 make sure that is fulfilled for for you to make sure that your 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 talk your presentation your live code goes well on the day like before so like you're there you already at the conference and like you mentioned that like usually there's a session for you so is there anything that you you always keep a mental note of that all oh, these things must be there or I need to check with the organizers that sort of thing like. Uh, I mean, uh, sure, I, and actually, that's a that's a very uh, important thing. So whenever I I give any talk which includes live coding, I make sure that I go to that venue a day before as well, so that I get hold of like how does the stage and how does the environment look like, and uh, for sure uh, connect with the organization organizers in a way that what are the equipments that they will be providing. Make sure you have all the internet connections. Make make sure you have the right system. Make sure you have the right devices. The spe- uh, I mean the mic. Uh, what Elisha uh, talk about, talked about. So I think it. You should give a fair uh, rehearse of the live coding the day before you actually want to do the presentation, and you actually want to do that. And actually, I what I do as well. Like for example, if my talk is tomorrow, and I watch few talks today as well at the conference, and I see what can go wrong in those talks. Right, because there are multiple live coding talks over there, and then take a clue from there that okay, maybe this is something that could have been gone wrong in your talk, and uh, make sure you give that place a visit. Make sure you uh, have a checklist that okay, before I make, before I step over on the stage, this is all what should be ready for me. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, so this is like on the on the non technical side. I think a lot of uh, right before presentation prep is mental is what the, what you tell yourself like holy fuck they're gonna hit me I'm gonna forget what I'm doing I don't know why I'm here why am I good enough like this kind of um, like negative thoughts is something that is probably very very um, salient especially when it's the first few talks that you, you do so so like my pre-game prep is uh, when I when I just started public speaking is that um, I would definitely put on makeup or find like, I would really, really dress up so that at least I feel like confident. So like when I'm putting on my eyeliner, but like, this is my pre-game war paint, and, <laughs> and that's that's how I prep. And I used to wear like my my brightest red lipstick. So so do things that make you feel confident. Today it's not the bright red line because I'm like okay already. So so you know do things that make you feel comfortable and confident about yourself. There's also the the talk about power posing. So there's a lot of talks that that power posing. Uh, how many of you have heard know what power posing is? Okay, it's basically like the um, like the Wonder Woman pose that you do. Like, you know, stretch out and take out a lot of space. It's supposed to like release testosterone to help you be more confident. But a lot of studies has also say that this is not producible. So it's kind of like bullshit. But I do think that it's it's good to like just help you relax a little bit and like take up more space so your your posture is right and you project confidence. Even nowadays when I speak, my first few minutes I still feel damn scared. Like it's the like the pregame like oh my god oh my god oh my god. Um, but as I get better at it, the story that I tell myself is more different. I tell myself that I'm selected because I have something good to share, even though I say we all or we all say that I don't know why we're here. But since I'm chosen, it must be somewhat legit. So so this is a story that I really tell myself that if I'm chosen, they already know who I am. They done their research. I didn't hide anything. So if they think I'm worth it, then I'm worth it. And I'm gonna give them the best show that I can do. Right. Um so, so that is sort of uh, the mindset shift. This in a big audience, there's going to be some audience who are very distracted. So don't care about them. Like really, just care about the people who are engaged with your story because they want to hear from you, right? And also like project energy. So when you start, start with a smile. Hi everyone, my name is blah blah blah, right? You start strong, even though you're panicking, just just pretend, just act. It's like acting, right? Like you are, you are like damn scared, but like fuck 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 fuck, but still you know. Hi everyone, my name is, and then you can continue on. So a lot of times it's just like the story you tell yourself and also it's also a little bit of acting. And I drink water. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. One more point, very important. You do right before I go on stage, like just right before I will drink water so that I don't it's almost like also I read somewhere but might be completely fake, but I'm just good at bluffing to myself is uh, the fight or flight situation. Sometimes when you're too nervous, when you eat something in your body, you're like, oh you can actually you're safe. So I try to drink water. Um, and I also drink coffee before so that I try to be alert but you got to pace your own like coffee intake because coffee, I don't know about you, coffee makes me pee 
So there was once that I drank coffee right before I had to go on stage, and like by the end of it, I was trying to explode. So that was that was fun. That was a good learning, but also somewhat awkward. So yeah. I think um, one thing that that really helps me because I do get a lot of anxiety even like right before I go to stage. I um, is one thing is to know is that the audience really wants to see you do well. The audience is not they do not bite. Uh, they do not bark, and the thing is, if the audience really wants to tear you down, then they are then they are the assholes, yep, not you. So everybody wants to see you do well. Everybody like, is in the audience, whether the distractor or not. They kind of want to. They are secretly rooting for you. You just don't know it. And one thing is, uh, I find it's good is to interact with the find find a way to interact with the audience. So like when I delivered my talk, I started off. Before I introduce myself, I asked the audience, "How many of you in the audience has learned something hard in your life? Raise your hand." So this was what I did for my talk. So everyone else is kind of engages and lets people, you know, like make a connection with you as a speaker, and you're also kind of able to sort of like, in a way, nudge them to be awake and respond to you. And so when once you have their attention, then you say, um, and then you can uh, introduce yourself and your topic. So that's so that's a trick that I learned at Toastmasters. Uh, actually, it's like uh, speaking of which, Toastmasters actually is a very good uh, avenue for you to build up your confidence in, in public speaking, uh, because it's peer to peer mentoring. Everybody is there to learn how to speak. They're able to give uh, very honest feedback. I mean, and you can try practicing your tech talks there. If let's say it coincides with the project speech that you're um, that you're supposed to deliver, because there's a certain education program that uh, Toastmasters has as well. So yeah, you can consider joining that. If you want to practice public speaking in general, and yeah, and generally like just get your peers to also like evaluate you. So Reno, I think you raised a point that you mentioned watching other speakers talks that day. But like as most of us know, a conference has a schedule. So this is more of a personal preference question. Is there any slot that you especially like or especially don't like? Because this is out of your control, right? I hate post immediate post lunch sessions, and I usually get those. <laughs> I usually get those in my uh, slots. Like it's, it's always like people, people are full, they are sleepy, and definitely they don't adhere to anyone. And those are the most difficult sessions that I feel. And for sure, I don't want to be the last session holder as well. I think it's okay for me to be the first session holder. It's completely okay for me. But immediate post lunch and the last session holders, I hate those sessions. Yeah. yeah. For me, I especially like the post tea break slots. Uh. Yeah, uh, because right, you see, uh, if let's say okay, take example, you take another slot, right? Maybe if you go immediately after another speaker, you don't have a lot of time to set up, right? So after the speaker finishes, you have to be there, and then everything must be up within like one two minutes. So I like like after uh, like for example a tea break, you can use the entire tea break slot to uh, slowly connect my this, connect my that, start start my ID, everything, make sure my resolution is correct, everything. Right, I can spend like ten minutes doing that, but you can't do that with any other slot, right? Uh, so I usually uh, try to put that request to the organizers when they're scheduling. Right, then another slot. Okay, I don't like to be the first slot. Uh, so it's like you like here you cannot see the mistakes that could be made by other people. But usually the first slot is always given to the keynote speaker. Uh, so yeah, so I, I never get that slot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not yet. Not yet. Yeah, not one yet. day. One day. <laughs> Yeah, cannot. Actually, conferences have started doing that, like especially for these reasons that if you go immediately after another speaker, you don't have enough time to set this up. I, then I guess usually the talks are for one hour, so 45 minutes is your slot, and then 15 minutes they they do spare this kind of uh, time for other speakers to you know warm up and then get ready for your talk. Yeah. So so you so you mentioned a little bit about like watching the talks before you go, right? For me, I don't do that. Like. I'm terrified. Like, what if the earlier talks are better than me? Then the bar is them high, indeed, right? <laughs> so I rather like I'll be in the room. I'm zoning out. So, so, so trying to prepare for it. So, so like your mileage may vary. Um, in terms of slots, I like to be near the near the beginning or near the end, because that's when people are not like drawn out by other talks. So, so again, this is like kind of out of your control unless you find someone to swap it with you. Maybe that's a strategy. 
for me it's like uh, why I like uh, watching other people uh, talking in a way for sure so that I can figure out if I I mean I have done some last minute amendments mm. by watching other people and those have been the most useful changes that I did in my presentation and more or less I mean this is what I tell everyone and this is what I tell myself as well I think Thomas was also saying the same thing don't take it too seriously like be professional about it be sincere about it but don't be too hard on yourself that oh my god what happens if I don't do well Oh my God, what happens? I mean, I have seen a lot of people who screwed up on this stage. They made fun of themselves. But as an audience, I love them. Like, I loved watching them and I loved watching them accepting their mistakes that, okay, maybe something went wrong and maybe something like this happened and they are okay with it and they moved on with it. So I think don't don't get too hard on yourself that, oh my God, what's going to happen? It's okay. I mean, for sure you have something. That's why you're going to go up to that stage and deliver that talk, right? So just don't stress yourself out. I think okay, no. Uh, well, I guess this is a. If you have, you say you don't have. Never mind. Has anything gone wrong oh, in your talks before? Always. Never. Which one do you? Which one are you walking? The one right that now? you feel yeah. is most in, uh, the the most horrifying one, like top of the horrified list. Okay. Yeah. So it's like one, one thing that happened to me, which I still find is pretty embarrassing, was what I. So the very first tech talk I, I did at Junior Dev, I, uh, I didn't want to show a live coding because it was work stuff and I was afraid that there would be too much sensitive information. I didn't go through all the checks. So I, what I did is I took screenshots and I, and I blurred out stuff that is potentially sensitive. But I would just tell them like this is what I did. I blurred it out because it's work stuff and I cannot show you. But when it was showing to internal colleagues, um, some of my other colleagues who had watched my Junior Dev tech talk said, hey, why don't you do a live coding demo? And for me, I've never done a live coding demo before. So, uh, so what happened was that the simulator that I was supposed to use wasn't working until like literally one and a half hours before I was supposed to present. So I didn't have much time to practice. And on the day it's on the presentation itself, I wanted the demo, but I was so nervous because I realized I was talking to a lot of senior devs and uh, I saw that they, some of them looked a bit bored. So I was, I was in my mind, I was thinking that how do I engage them? But it came to a point where I completely forgot to do the live code demo. Yeah, so that is like, and, and so was like, at the end, I, I, I realized that after I was way past the point I wanted to do the live code demo and in my mind on stage I was thinking, Oh shit, I forgot to do the live code demo. What do I do now? So at first I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll do it at the end. At the end, I realized uh, I couldn't figure out. It was not, <laughs> I wasn't sure whether it was too late. I just didn't know how to slot it in uh, at a point in time. And, um, and at the end, I was kind of beating myself up over it because it was a chance for me to do a live code demo and I kind of ruined it. But I realized, but after that, what I learned was that it is good to insert a slide that actually says the word demo <laughs> in um, no, somewhere in that whichever point you want to to, um, to show it so that even if you are nervous and you forget like like what happened to me there's a slide that actually reminds you yeah you're supposed to do the demo now so you can actually say okay with this I will, let me show you the demo because the thing is the slides um, like what I mentioned earlier even though it's like try to avoid using notes right but sometimes your slides can be useful as prompters to you um, even though they're not really like proper notes per se. So this is, this is a very uh, hard lesson learned for me. So yeah, I hope you don't have to make the same mistake as what I did. And yeah. More horror stories, yeah, please. Yeah, I think not so yeah, so there's a few, there's a few time like, I think there was a, once there was a tech ladies event where expecting 200 people and the cable doesn't work. I'm like, holy shit, and the entire event could die. But good thing, engineer.ng, like, save our ass. Uh, they were there with extra cable. So, you know, always make friends with Michael. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, like, conference uh, presentation tip, make friends with Michael. Yeah, there are jokes that, that, that I say, and I try to save myself. I just, like, died even more. So just, just move on. Or there's stuff that, you know, yeah, it's really just, I've even tried, like, I said a joke, nobody laughs. So I tried this thing where I say, like, self-deprecating where like, oh, actually that was a joke, but nobody, I guess I should probably stop saying it. <laughs> but like, <laughs> like, people don't get it too, so that I don't even get sympathy laugh. I was trying to go for that, like my bar was that low and then nobody laughs on the end. Anyway, then, you know, move on. So that happened.
happened, and I uh, because one of one of the few talks that I um, given on was on my startup failure, like what my experiences building a startup and it failed, what happened, and there were also points in time where it got so emotional that I, I almost wanted to cry on stage. That was that was also like I won't call it a failure, but that was that could be disastrous if I didn't rehearse and uh, do really like moderate my emotions. That could happen. Um, yeah, but all in all, I really agree with with what you say that that. Whatever talk you do, right? It's just one talk, and most people don't remember. Like only you remember your like mistakes, and so like most people won't remember everything that I've talked about. And so so just take it take it easy and have fun. Like try a talk, and uh, you will get better the more you do. So when it comes to like rehearsing, for those who maybe uh, your shitty colleagues or what, um, I'll be. <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy. I, I think we should keep this community going. Like, if there's anyone who wants to go and talk, maybe we could just come together again and and like, help each other rehearse. Or I'll be I'll be free to see how we can organize something small and we can just help one another to keep this going. Because I don't think that this should be like just a one day thing. I think this should be a culture of helping one another to become like conference speakers. So um, yeah, happy to volunteer and help. No, huh? Okay, can. Oh, no, oh, no. He's a professional speaker, nothing went wrong. The most important skill for climbing the career ladder in general. So it's, yeah. it's a hard challenge, as we all hear, mm -hmm. but it's so worth it. I mean, I have countless stories of people that, like, after conference talks, suddenly got a job here, moved there, did this. I mean, it's always a step up. It's maybe the best skill you can add, like, in general. So it's totally worth trying. And also free travel, like who do you think gets flown around to Europe for free? Hashtag cheap Asian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just really good exposure, especially when you're paid to fly. Uh. Like they pay for flights and hotel, I'm like, wow, them ballers, yeah, I made it in life. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, why don't you share a little bit more about like your speaking experience? Because oh, you are also. Really yeah, yeah, you're like, <laughs> yeah, like inter regional speaker. Whoa. Uh, whoa. Yeah, tell uh, us more about it. Okay, so I, I'm going to shorten it. I hashtag cheap Asian. Uh, don't want to pay to go for conferences. King Wing can understand. So I volunteered with this gentleman here. Uh, one year he was looking for a host. Then I'm like, uh, I can host. Because uh, thick skin, then be fine. Personally, I know there are some people who feel hosting is uh, more stressful. Uh, I'm the opposite because I feel hosting, number one, you don't really need to prepare. Number two, it's a good excuse for you to talk to speakers you otherwise cannot talk to. And then number three, nobody remembers you as a host because you're not, you not the main show. So that was a really great way uh, to get in for free. Um, but like all jokes aside, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> how, how how do you get like flown around, you know, to like different countries? I'm also very curious. Like, at what point do you start charging for your talks? Like, say, hey, you want me at your conference, pay me. Uh, for me personally, I've never, I've never asked, I never asked a speaker fee. I've been lucky to have a couple of conferences who do that as a uh, uh, part of their their thing. They do give a honor honorarium. English is not my strong suit. Um, for me personally, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I had the f people like Thomas, people like the organizer of a, a conference in Hong Kong called WebConf, take a chance on a first time speaker because, like, you've never. So, what's really nice about in Singapore, right, if you speak at a meetup, engineers.sg records you. And that sometimes is a big boost for first time speakers because as a conference organizer, Especially for us here, Southeast Asia, and we apply for Europe, America. It's not cheap to fly us there. They are taking a calculated risk. I'm investing in this first-time speaker, hoping that you know uh, it's going to be a good speaker. So uh, I've had conference organizers jump on a uh, con call with me just to sort of like get a feel of how I am, how I speak. Having a video is a big plus. It's uh, still accepted. <laughs> have a big is a big plus and. Uh, for, for myself, it was that first conference, it was that f first exposure that people in the audience, other speakers in the audience, they're like, oh, I've never seen this person before. But after that, if you uh, happen to do a good enough job, um, word gets around. And then, like, I think what Thomas mentioned is that for us, from being from this region, we, you can think of it negatively or positively. 
we are a diverse we are diversity candidates. Uh, for myself, I don't I, I don't mind. I don't mind that I am the I am the token the token foreigner. Because for me I feel opportunities like this are uh, few and far between. If they are there, I'm going to take it. So I, I can't, I can't, if you want me to be on the token, if that gets me in the door, that gets me on the stage, uh, that's good enough. Because once then, once you're on the stage, right, then it's on you. Uh, it's on you to be, it's on you to be good. Yeah. So, you know. And about the word getting around, I mean, it's so true that you go to one conference and there are the organizers, organizers from other conference present over there and after it all, they'll be like, hey, you know, we are organizing something like this. We would be, we would love you to be on board on that uh, conference and something like that. I mean, for me, I mean, I have, uh, so I, I didn't travel world that much. I mean, I just, I, I'm from India and I came to Singapore and before this, I think I just went to South Korea. That's it. But with conferences, I think I did my Europe tour. I think I did my Russia tour and I think I did my US tour. So I think it's worth it. Otherwise, it's, I mean, it's too expensive to afford. <laughs> yeah. So we talked talk a lot about uh, speaking. Uh, one thing that Elisha raised is what happens after you've given your talk? There are some things that you, it's not like you go on stage, give a talk and call it a day. I mean, you can. But I mean, there are extra things that you can value add for, to build for yourself as well as your audience. So since you were the one who raised the point, you may start talking about build your speaker portfolio. Like things to do after you're done. You've given it, everything went well, okay, after stage, what do you do? Yeah, so I think that the, the first thing that you want to do after your talk is to make yourself available for people to approach you. A lot of times, you know, after I give a talk, people like, people will come up to me and say like, hey, thanks for doing this. First, it's a confidence boost when they say that. Second, they might also come with opportunity. Like I would like, I would like you to come and speak to my like school, or, like to come to speak to my conference, my meetup. So these are like great ways to to like expand your network. Therefore, which sort of links linked to my previous point, you want to if you drink coffee to stay awake, make sure you time your coffee. Because there was once like immediately after I talked, I ran to the restroom. By the time I came out, people sort of like left ish already, because they couldn't find me. So I thought I left. They thought I left, but no, I'm just in the toilet. So, so little things, you know, might have some form of effect. So being available to like, be around the event for like networking session, that is like the low hanging fruit. Thereafter is um, if you do have engineers.sg, shout out, recording the, the, yeah, your, your presentation, keep the link, like you can share it on like your social media, like, hey friends, I did this, what do you think? Um, the whole feedback thing is a, is a very you know, soft way of promoting yourself. You no, know, like, hey guys, I did this. Look <laughs> at me, I'm awesome. But like, you know, hey friends, I just did, did this. I'd love to have your feedback. But if they watch it, they, they will know who you are and what you talk about, right? So, so it's also like a subtle way of uh, being promotional. So, of course, I like, have your own web presence, like your own website, or you can share it on, on your LinkedIn. So that sort of builds your reputation and um, helps with momentum because a lot of times, um, a lot of times in my sort of like speaking experience is because like people know who I am or, or is one degree again uh, away. So like the conference organizer, they know someone and that someone actually sort of like recommended me. So, so I, I did like, I'm very grateful for all the sponsors that I have who opened this kind of doors for me. So yeah, what else? Uh? Stole yeah, the yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, okay, just like does, the, is this something that like all of you do, or is it's just me? No. I do it. Uh, I do also. It's like two, there are two steps officially to success, which is do good things and talk about it. But then the third step is talk about the talking. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I think that's a good amount of time, and I thank you. Uh, all four of my panelists that have somehow been duped into being on my panel. Uh, thank you for going along with it. Uh, hopefully you are still my friends after this. Uh, when you see my name, please don't run away. Uh, yeah, so... Can we do audience questions? Yeah, so let's open it to the floor. If anybody has any questions for anybody, everybody can also ask Michael. Michael also counts. Uh, yeah, anybody have any questions or not? I see a hand. Hi. Um, I'm Nicolette. Um, so just now we, 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 
uh, mentioned, and she asked a question about like how long do the speakers um, take to prepare. Um, and what we've taken so and what we've got so far is like what you prepare the day before, or I mean we just got a rough gauge of what you do to prepare, but we don't um, have a like a minimum period whereby you must prepare within this period. If not, like you're gonna screw up something like that. Uh, <laughs> is there a, like minimum range of period? Okay, I believe this answer will vary. So let's have everybody share their. I have an opinion about that. You can can. We'll come to you, sir. Uh, I think the period starts even before you apply. Before you submit your CFP. Okay, so uh, my way of doing it is that uh, before I even uh, apply for the, the CFP, right, make sure that it's even possible to give the talk. Because a, a lot of my uh, presentations are on hardware. So what I do is that I'll make sure the input and output works, right? The, the in and out. If they both, okay, I'll submit the CFP already. Then if I get selected, I just throw as much time as I, as I can in for the in-between part, right? Yeah, so... Uh, after okay, after submitting a CFP, right, then it's time to work on it. Okay, so what I will schedule I work on is that two weeks before the actual conference date, I will rehearse in front of my colleagues. So I have that two weeks buffer to make any changes if needed. So you will work backwards, right? So uh, usually I'll take about one month or so to prepare for the talk. So maybe one month plus two weeks plus this plus that you can get a rough time, rough schedule. Yeah, for me it's also about the same for a month or a month and a half. So like by when I, bef well of course like when you're submitting a proposal or like you're bouncing an idea off someone making your pitch, you should aga aga like roughly know what you want to say. And once you're selected, that's when I start thinking about the my story arc. Like the hero goes on a journey. What are some of my little monsters I'm fighting? What's my final big boss and the ending? Right, so to end on a high life, I can. Um, so so I start thinking about that. And about two to three weeks before that, that's when I do the full rehearsal, like in front of a live audience, or when I start recording myself. I think for me, it kind of it varies a fair bit. Yeah. I think also depends on how familiar you are with the topic, because mm -hmm. something certain. Um, I've heard certain talks where they say, "Oh, I heard somebody else give a topic on this, and I wanted to explore this. Hence, I want to where to do research on the topic." So that's what some people did. Now I think on the same meetup that I delivered my first tech talk, there was a speaker who was talking about I think the health report on the internet or something like that. So he actually he knows that he's also another junior dev, but he said he heard this at a conference and he wanted to find out more. So he went to research and after that he shared what he found out mm. in the tech talk uh, during the same meetup that I delivered my first tech talk. So that's something you can also do that you don't have to be 100% familiar, but in the process of researching, you also um, do like different iterations of your presentation. So you don't have to um, do your presentation in one shot. You don't have to do all, all your preparation in one shot. Just so like, like, you know how you have like sprints and you don't build the product in one shot and then you launch it. It's kind of like you build uh, MVP and then it's like 1.1, 1.2, et cetera, et cetera uh, and all that. So, you just build, and then along the way, you just try to practice, ask for feedback, and when, and then after that, you take all the feedback and you build the, the next iteration, and you repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, usually, for me, I like to do it a few months, at least start from a few months before you do it, so that it's a lot more relaxed. You don't have to rush, and you can just find like pockets of time whenever you're free to work on different aspects. Maybe be it like the research, or be it the slides, or maybe be it, like. Um, uh, like you know, practicing how to present in front of people. So it's like you just try it. Like I like to do it at a, at a leisurely pace, and then um, so at least I don't get too anxious or too scared. And then also, it's like the more you do it, the more familiar you are the material. The less likely you're going to have to use notes, and more likely your presentation is going to be more natural. So yeah, it's like if you if you guys know agile methodology, just try to try to apply it to your own speech as well. I think it's, it's very useful, especially if you're quite new to speaking in front of an audience. Now she's talking product management. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm a strong believer in if you have a great opportunity but you don't know how to do it, still say yes and then figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. So many times it has happened that I really liked some topic which I'm really, really interested in and the CFP dates are very nearby, like the CFPs are about to close. So I just focus on having a great CFP and forget about what exactly the content that I'm going to do, like the proper slides and everything. 
So prepare a creative CFP, submit it, and then wait for it to get submitted, meanwhile, uh, accepted, and then meanwhile, keep on learning about it. As soon as I get that, okay, your CFP has been accepted, actually for me, the very first thing that I do is I find the subject matter expert in that uh, material. I usually talk on like technical topics that I do on everyday basis. And I have great colleagues like who, who are the subject matter experts on that. So I just sit with them. I, uh, I run, through, uh, run them through my idea of my talk, like, okay, this is what I'm going to talk about. What do you think? And this and that. They give me some ideas. And then I prepare a rough presentation. And then I directly present it to my team. So I, I kind of work it the back, uh, backwards way. Like, I have the rough idea. I present it. I get, get the feedback. And then I refine it, kind of that. So and my, so my uh, rehearse, it, start, it gets started like pretty early stages in pretty early stages, but the final slides, they get ready by like just a day or two or maybe just the, on the day of the conference mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. So I work in a backward manner, like just start getting the feedback earlier. The more feedback, the more refined it will be. Okay, so it, it's actually quite different for everybody. And Mr. Gorson? So from a conference organizer perspective, the question is really easy to answer. Uh, I think if you haven't put a lot of work into the talk itself, it's unlikely to become a great talk. It's just a, there's a direct correlation on on uh, how well you prepare, rehearse, how well you know the topic. You can know the top. I mean, easy is if you know the topic by heart before you even apply. Right? Th those are typically the best talks when you really know, like, from what angle? What do I really? know and understand, which is harder of a question than, than you might think sometimes to figure that out. What, what, what do I actually know? What have I done and used and created that I really am the expert on? And everybody is. Like, it's not that somebody hasn't lived. It's just like you all have done something and like that might just be valuable. You just need to find out what makes that unique to you. Um, it can also be something that you want to find out, right? And you, you apply like... Um, what was your name, sorry? Renu. Yes, Renu said. Um, and you just give yourself the challenge to figure it out before the conference. But you have to make enough space to do it well. Um, I mean, we have crazy speakers at JSConf. Like, I think maybe some of you remember Simon Swain. I mean, mm. he puts more than 200 hours into his talk presentations. Uh, he codes up uh, unique environments to run his code in. He makes stories. He writes like the whole storyline and so on. And it's a nuts amount for talks. But the presentations become incredible. Like they're just like, whoa. Uh, also very unexpected. It's not like a quickly thrown together slide deck or anything. It's it's custom programming, like game programming and and things like that. Uh, I mean, we had like some some crazy crazy um, presenters that spend. A, a long time on talks and uh, you can see how over time the experience of having put so much thought into it really makes you more confident on stage makes it an easier presentation can make it more engaging and so on uh, so it's I think there's a direct correlation oh. any other questions um, I have two questions one kind of just come into mind is I'm interested in uh, uh, how Renu prepares a topic that you're not originally familiar with and how to make to make yourself comfortable like giving a talk after that and my other question is um, for the conferences you talk to is there normally a Q&A session and if there is what if someone asks you a question that you're you're not you're not sure the answer is? Fortunately, I know the answer of the question <laughs> that you just asked me. <laughs> so um, about the topics that I'm not very familiar with, how do I prepare for them? For sure, as Thomas said, that it becomes a challenge. I don't want to just run run through some topic and then give a shitty presentation in front of so many people. Uh, so I challenge myself and I start doing a project on that. I always like uh, put that project on my GitHub and then I mean I, I guess it's usually 
uh, it's a month's difference between when you submit the CFP and when the actual conference happens. So you have few months over there. And I think it's a fair amount of time for you uh, to prepare deep enough into that topic. So the way I do is I, uh, I take it as a project. I create a personal project on that topic. Like for example, uh, nowadays I'm, I'm trying to learn about app bundle, like it's a new thing in Android. Uh, we at Grab are not, not personally using it, but it's a, it's a very big thing in market right now because of the APK size increasing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to learn about it and I wanted to speak about it so that's why I submitted few CFPs but because I'm not using it on my everyday basis right so I created a personal project in which I'm using APK bundle and I'm learning for, uh, through it like every day so I hope that my CFP gets accepted in some of the talk and I can give a presentation about it so yeah I mean I guess hands-on experience you you have to have it you cannot just read the theory about some topic and then you can give a presentation especially if it's a technical thing you have to go through that shit so that you know that you know it. Yeah. And about the Q&As, I think it happens that sometimes there are so many experienced audience people over there and they ask you a question which you might not be able to answer. Like it happens. Uh, to me, how I have uh, tackled these kind of problems, I, tried, uh, I do not try to <laughs> fake the answer if I don't know it. I uh, upfront go and say that uh, for sure, I say it's a good question. That's 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 the kind to put it. Like it's a great question that you asked, and uh, sometimes I use uh, let's take it offline as well that we are running out of time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean I do. I, I mean we I, we all learn these things right from uh, other videos. But if I don't know it, I just say that uh, I'm not very familiar. I mean I cannot answer your question right now, but I can search about it and then uh, let's get connected and then I can get back to you for this answer. Honesty, the audience is on your side anyway. Yeah. Really, like I have not seen a single conference where the audience doesn't want the speakers to succeed. Yeah. Like they are all there for you. So just honest is fine. I'm, I mean, sometimes uh, somebody else in the audience can also answer that question if they know it, and it has happened. Yeah. You can also decline a Q and A. Yeah. We had speakers before that were like, I'm not, like I don't want a Q and A. Like actually, we don't, we barely do Q and As. Yeah, with reference to what Thomas said, again, it depends on the format of the conference. For example, JSConf, we don't do uh, Q&As. Only, only if the speaker specifically requests it. Yeah, so it's not, a, a norm. it's not a norm. There are also some conferences that do curated Q&As, which means that you, uh, the host or the MC behind the scenes will actually collect questions and then they pick the ones that uh, sort of... Because the MC is going to gonna try to... to no, nobody wants to make you look bad, so the, they will curate sort of the most relevant questions. So it's sort of more of a, if you had some things during the talk that you, you didn't have time to cover, they, they'll curate that for you, so in a sense they are helping you. Uh, again, you can also say, uh, no, I don't want to do Q&A, that's completely legitimate. Uh, most conference organizers will respect that. In fact, very few conferences that I attend have open mic, like anything goes kind of Q&As, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure about anybody else's experience with Q&As. Uh, so for the GoFuCon, when I spoke at last year, right, uh, I could see the questions that the audience, okay, they they have to submit the questions through a web portal okay. website. Then I could see the questions, all the questions, and I pick the one that I can uh -huh. answer the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so because sometimes the MC may not have the context or may not be technically savvy enough to know which questions are the easy for you to answer. So the, the MC just showed me the, her phone and, okay, I answer this question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like... Um, about the question of uh, submitting for proposals, actually I have a different point of view from Renu. Like I would only submit proposals for things that I, I know. Okay. I'm confident knowing from the get-go, then I'll write proposal for it. Um, in terms of Q&A, usually after a presentation, a Q&A, if you can answer, answer. If you cannot answer, just say that I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't know. And, and it's completely fine, they, they will understand. Um, but in a QA and a for a panel discussion, if you're also keen in, in like that form of a public speaking panel, yes. discuss discussion really depends on um, who the host is. Oops. So, no, I'm not <laughs> saying you can, like, yeah. So I, I should remind you what you should be doing. So for example, Thanks. for panel discussion, you can, the questions are usually pre-prepared. 
So just ask the host, like, hey, can I have the questions before that? And then think about what are some of the three points or the, or the messages, key messages you want to bring across. Um, and and like, what, you, what you want to teach the audience. Again, I have the audience in mind. There was once, there was a sort of a impromptu Q&A. Like this person said, like, hey, I want, I'd love to have you go live, or like a Facebook live, and we talk about tech ladies. Um, and he started asking a lot of questions about Facebook, which at that point in time, that was not what I signed up for. And I was not very happy about it. So when he asked me a question, I'm like, oh, I don't know about Facebook, but however, tech ladies does this, 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 and I say what I want to say. And, and then I blacklist this guy. So, <laughs> right, it's not fair to bait and switch on your speaker, right? So, but I do understand that in, in certain events, the host or the moderator wants to be a bit naughty because it gives a good show, right? If you start arguing the speaker, it's like, you know, everybody can eat popcorn, right, and watch to it. So, so it really depends on, on um, the, who, the, what type of event it is and also what format the discussion is about. I think, right, if let's say you want to avoid having to answer the questions on the spot, maybe, like, you know, at the end of the presentation, if you have any queries, uh, then you can reach out to me on my social media. So that, or that email. So this one is, you can kind of filter out what to answer, and you have a bit of time to recover after your presentation to be able to answer the questions. Or you can do research before answering. You don't have to answer straight away. So it, and it also helps, because sometimes some people may not have questions straight away, or they have questions, but they don't know how to phrase it. And by the time they phrase it, maybe the Q&A session's up, and they don't have the opportunity. So sometimes I think, uh, it's not something that I have done personally, but I have seen other speakers do it, and I thought it was a very good way to engage your audience, but you don't have to engage it right away. The question? Sort of like based on like first like first hand like observation, right? But so I so last year I actually went for a panel discussion, like tech panel discussion, whereby during the Q and A there were actually audiences who were like posting a lot of criticisms about the panel discussion in general and about the moderator. So so like to, to put it in a more general context, like how do you deal with um, the sort of like criticisms, like very harsh criticisms? From the like audience, especially when you're a speaker, and then, and then, and sort of um, things are quite live mm. Hashtag how to deal with haters. Mm. Is okay. Like, um, so just now I mentioned that in general the audience doesn't want to see you fail, but if they want to see you fail that way, then they are pretty much assholes. Uh. So, um, so I think just know that. Um, that you know, when you are chosen, like, I think that what um, the panelists and, and Hui Ching has uh, mentioned, if you're chosen to be a panel speaker or to be a speaker in general, there's a reason why they chose you. Um, and, you and because you have something worthy to share. If people want to criticize you when you're up there, then um, you can tell them, say, okay, maybe we can take this offline. Because sometimes a lot of the audience they don't want to hear uh, an argument. It's wasting everybody else's time, and it doesn't make people happy unless it is maybe um, a discussion that is relevant, that is very, very relevant to um, to what was being shared or presented. Then sure, but I think the moderate, like the moderator, um, in general, should also um, be mindful when to intercept and say, "Okay, we can let's move on to another question or so." But if not, then you can yeah, just try to divert it to a different topic or say, let's take it offline. So uh, the audience, was the audience like combative by like, saying like, you're wrong, you're stupid, um, or is okay, it like on Twitter? Okay, like, it's, it's, a big, it's a mixture. So mm. um, there was a live Q&A and then people were using the live Q&A to criticize the mm. AI panel. Okay. Um, I'm really sorry that this happened to you. Like it obviously sucked, uh, and, I, and I cannot imagine like just the amount of like stress and embarrassment. Mm. And fortunately, I do think that these seldom happen in the tech meetup. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it before. Uh, but I, I've asked people to like, leave tech ladies event because they're a bit like creepy, and that that happens. Um, I. I think that most times people are nice, but to say that everything will always be like rainbow and unicorns, that's a lie. Shit happens, and, and um, that's unfortunate, but that's real. 
So I think in terms of like in general, anything that you want to do to step out of the norm, you will have praises and you will have criticism, right? That's just part of like standing out because you stood out, right? So that will that will always happen. Like for me, it's always been um, find your supporters. Like okay, first of all, you have to evaluate what they're saying. Does it does it make sense, right? If they say that oh your dress is ugly, I'm like screw you. So yeah. that is like I don't care. That's your that's your opinion. I'm fine. But is there something that I I've said that I found to be racist and sexist and I agree with them? Then that to me is a is a constructive feedback, constructive criticism, whether how refined or unrefined the way they present their thought and opinion. Right? I will take that into consideration, but I won't I won't let it affect me too much. So it depends on what they're talking about and so what the context is. Generally, you will find haters, and as Lady Gaga says, like internet is a toilet. Oh no, social, social media, media is the, the toilet, toilet of the internet. internet. <laughs> yeah, so so that that happens, especially when it's anonymous, right? I suppose this is a like a pigeonhole Q and A thing uh, where you can't find who said it, right? Like, yeah, yes, like I Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, so that happens. Find find your supporters, like people who get you and will support you, and the rest you can just tune it out. Uh, unfortunately, the moderator was so mm. it didn't really so my so my fellow like my fellow friend I we were very uncomfortable with mm. how the two interacted out. Yeah, that could also be a, a feedback for the moderator. I think moderator is almost like someone who encourages conversation and is also the shield, right? The protector. Sometimes a like, question people are asked that I felt is not relevant. I'll say, thank you for your question. This is not relevant. Let's go back to what I want to talk about. And or, or just like divert, right? So the, 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 Q and, the panel, the Q&A that I had about, about like Facebook and tech ladies, I'll just say that I'm unable to comment on the Facebook point of view, however, for tech ladies, and then I just do my pitch. Right, so sometimes it's diverting, sometimes it's feedback, and sometimes it's just like, you know, just, 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 this is an unfortunate event, hopefully this is a one-time event, and then you give feedback on how it can be improved and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I guess they pretty much covered it. <laughs> Any other question? If not, can we applause? The panelists, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so the, the next time I have panelists, please still come, ho. don't see my name and run away. Yeah. Um, so 